All right. Next speaker is going to be Jake Applebaum. He's had a slight title change. Instead of anonymity, I should say he's from Redacted. Uh, he didn't decide for himself to be anonymous. Anyway, his new title is Straw Man in the Middle, a Modest Post-Snowden Proposal. Great. Um, so uh, I work with uh, the Tor Project and also with the Technical University of Eindhoven, but I am emphatically not associated with either of those groups right now for this talk proposal. Uh, so I definitely do not speak for either of my employers or those communities that I am related to. Um, I, as an introduction, I've heard a lot of people talking about how they want to have a secure golden key. And then I heard a lot of people in the technical community say that it just can't be done, that we can't do lawful interception. And I wanted to call out why we can't do that, but I wanted to, to suggest that it's actually a political problem, not a technical problem. And I wanted to do it in the most inflammatory way possible that would make sure that every single stakeholder in the discussion would be angry at me in the end, which I thought was an important property because it shows where people really stand. But most of all, it, um, it shows what we think of each other, which is useful. It's illuminating for what to do next. So <clears throat> post-Snowden. Snowden's actually still with us, and there's a political situation that it exists there. <laughs> now, obviously, just like um, before Christ and after Christ, we have to think of the world differently now that His Holiness has come down with His revelations. And I do think that that's important to acknowledge the difference of a sort of, let's say, pre-Snowden world and a post-Snowden world in terms of the revelations, if we want to use this holy, holy language. Um, but, but I do want to say, you know, he really is a person. He really still does exist. And uh, the information that we have gained is, of course, world-changing. It's In the Hannah Arendtian sense, it really is revolutionary in that it changed our minds about how we think. And that's, of course, important. And so when we talk about the changes that we've had in our mind, what changes do we really mean? You know, in the technical communities, we talk about how the NSA, you know, they did some cool trick with uh, dual EC, DRBG, and we know that they're saboteurs, and the saboteurs are everywhere, and they put things there, okay. But in the general population, there's also a change. One of the changes that we see is a, a kind of fear. Um, people that aren't Americans, for example, um, they, they sort of joke uh, with me and with other people, and you hear people talking about being put on lists, they talk about being monitored, they talk about how maybe they're targets. There's an uneasiness, a default. The post-Snowden world is a world in which we don't think of ourselves as being free. That's what post-Snowden means. It also means changes where we try to regain that freedom. Now, not everyone will, of course, agree with that because some of the people who are the most guilty are the ones that pretend they've made no changes and that they have nothing to hide as a strategy for not standing out. You know who you are. You can, of course, object in order to further prove that point. But um, so let's look at this. What actually happened? What happened is that Snowden revealed the plumbing, right? So a bunch of uh, different uh, dishonest spies, they said they were mad, not that he showed the bucket of water. You know, here's the surveillance. Rather, they're mad that he showed the plumbing that produces the output, the bucket of water being the surveillance product, but the plumbing being the machinery. So, for example, X key score is something they're really, really, really mad about being revealed. And the reason is because once you understand how X key score works, you understand how to subvert it, but also, more importantly, you understand like the dynamic of the power, right? There's a latent form that exists, and it actually is the master of the obvious form, if we were to uh, misquote Philip K. Dick and misquote the Greek philosopher that he was quoting in his book uh, about that. But basically, this is the thing. We found core internet protocols are broken as part of the offense in depth. We see the way mass surveillance takes place, and we see that so-called targeted surveillance happens through mass surveillance. So there's this part of the discourse, which I also want to call out, which is uh, a lot of really respectable people talk about how mass surveillance bothers them, but targeted surveillance doesn't bother them at all because everybody knows, you know, there's like somebody that's a valid target. But as a person who's being targeted in an espionage investigation in the United States and looking at 45 years in prison, I personally would like to say, you know, just because you might be a valid target doesn't mean that we should end the discussion there. Let's actually talk about what it means. Everybody in this room is a valid target depending on how you look at it. And what does that mean once you become a valid target? And what kind of world do we want to build in that case? And so since I'm a highfalutin, ridiculous, you know, idealist, that's what I'm proposing we talk about today. Um, so the shift. I want to call on a couple people in the audience to just sort of confirm I'm not completely off base here. But uh, for example, would 
Ian, would you say that we have experienced a huge shift with people feeling like when they pick up the phone that they ask themselves if they're being listened to? Did, did people develop a double consciousness in your experience as a university professor? Just in, just people in your life. It's a, probably, not. probably not. So they don't pick up the phone. They don't. They don't think about anything. When you and Cat call each other on the phone, you don't talk differently. Not the general class of people, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. <clears throat> okay, so are there people in your life though that maybe think about telephones differently? There exist such people. There exist such people. Okay, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> what phone? What phone? Tanya says. I did not have a phone call with that woman, exactly. <laughs> it's a, the metadata lives on forever. So, okay, we looked at this handful of protocols that changed. One of the big changes uh, that we see, for example, um, is that we're moving away from unencrypted protocols where passive attacks are free, effectively. So X Keyscore just grabs everything they can, and then it puts it into a database, especially when it's selected. But it puts it into a, a sort of ring buffer, if you will, and things flush out of the ring buffer. And so some of the protocols, we want to make it harder to distinguish between different traffic, you know, patterns and different users and so on. And so we started to understand how and why we might design those protocols a little bit differently. And basically, you know, 1960 called and a bunch of Internet people said, oh, gosh, how could we have ever learned that without Edward Snowden? And thankfully, they've learned that now. So that's useful. Um, but this is another key change that I've noticed. Um, Though there's a flip side to this, which is that a lot of people deny this. But I wonder if I could have another failed survey of the room, and we could find out if this is something you or someone you know has experienced after the Snowden revelations. I'm definitely in that list. I would say that there is a pervasive fear that exists. Uh, depends. If you know Muslims, for example, the pervasive fear really started after September 11th. Uh, 2001, you know, uh, Muslims, in my experience, in the United States, tend to divide their friends into people they knew before 9-11 and people they knew after 9-11, which is a shift. That's a pervasive fear shift that I've experienced. And additionally, the feeling of helplessness is a really big one. Non-technical people in particular say, like, what can we do about this? We just have to accept it. And there's a kind of nihilism that goes along with that. And I, even though I really like The Big Lebowski and I think it's a fantastic film, I'm not a fan of nihilism. And I feel that it is really a, a, a bad thing that we allow that to, to, to persist. So there's a reason for this. Is that the default is that we're being monitored all the time. The default is that there's this huge surveillance state that's there. And really what it comes down to is that we just don't trust the authorities anymore. Germans don't trust that the Americans will treat them fairly. The French don't trust them. For example, Americans like myself, they don't, they don't believe that we can trust the police. So I was thinking, what if we flip this on its head? What if we said, help the police, right? NWA, great American philosophers that they are, they, they said something different about the police. So I was thinking we could flip that around. So imagine, help the police. Maybe we can flip the fatalistic attitude around, right? This is just for you, Isis. So <clears throat> when we joke about being on lists, why is that? Because we can be put on a list. And why, why? Because total monitoring is a problem. So what if we changed it so that we knew with the core internet protocols, for example, that we, that we weren't being monitored all the time in a meaningful way? What if instead there was an, an encryption and anytime someone tampered, then we had detection? Right? But that's crazy. Can you imagine moving from a world with dumb telephones to smart computers and on these computers they had some sort of, I don't know, short authentication strings which would be detectable? Why well, the authorities would never allow such a thing to happen. Except, whoops, it did. Okay, so now we live in a world of detectable surveillance. So what does that mean to us, really? It means that now we can see when attacks take place, when certain kinds of surveillance is taking place, when tampering takes place. So a good, a good point, which was made by the UN Special Rapporteur in the European Parliament yesterday or the day before, is that encryption is here to stay. And it goes without saying, of course, anonymity is here to stay as well, within certain bounds, obviously. You know, global passive attacker, global active attackers, Maybe your anonymity per flow might be here, you know, occasionally. Maybe it won't be. But in general, we'll have some of these things. And, uh, of course, it is also possible that only a small set in every society will have these things, but it's not going to go away, right? So passive interception has to move to active interception. And that's actually something that we see. 
We see that everywhere, actually. And that's part of where the targeted malware comes in. And that's where people say, oh, well, you know, I don't mind so much about, you know, breaking into terrorist computers, you know, because I'm never going to be a terrorist. You know, have some aspirations and just remember that actually it's possible that uh, you don't make that decision, right? To you, you will never be that, but to someone else, you've always been that based on whatever properties you have about yourself. So that's not actually your choice. But in any case, moves to active. Everything moves to active. And there are two things I want to call out that really change this. Um, one is a set of voice over IP protocols, which was designed by Phil Zimmerman there in the back. So, you know, implemented in Silent Circle, implemented in Signal. So raise your hand if you have a smartphone. Raise your hand if you installed Signal. Right. So you guys are living in the post, uh, let's say, post-passive surveillance world. Right? You're, you're now living in the active surveillance world. In order to listen to your calls, someone has to actively tamper. That doesn't mean that they can't. I, I promise you if you have an iPhone 6 that you've got major problems. And, uh, and for, for, you'll find out someday, and I look forward to that day. But, uh, it, you know, it's a problem. But it's still a different kind of problem where it was free and now it costs some money. And the second thing, which is really going to change the game, is something that just launched a couple of days ago, which is the Let's Encrypt Certificate Authority. So basically all HTTP, but actually every other protocol that uses TLS or, or X509 related certificates, um, you're going to have that deployed. So that means for basically mail, for web, for Jabber, for everything, you're going to find yourself having the ability to detect tampering where previously you didn't. Now, it doesn't mean, of course, that you're going to know what to do then, but I propose that we might think about what we'd like to do. Um, and, of course, this will impact intelligence, but I actually don't want to focus on intelligence services because they're fucking criminals, and we don't want to talk about criminals. We want to talk about people we can control in a lawful manner, and everybody knows that the police are on our side, and so it's important to understand that since the police are on our side and they are our friends, especially you, ISIS, it is the case that we want to talk about how we as friends can get along. And that's, that's the important part here, is to, to make sure that we can really get along with law enforcement because they're good guys. They're on our side. And, and they want to help us, right? They want to make society more safe. They want to make sure that things are more honest. You get the transparency that you want. You get the accountability that you want. So how do we get cryptographic accountability from honest parties? Well, you can't, you can't actually get it from dishonest parties, but you can get it from honest parties, right? And there's a technical way to do that. And so what could we do here? One thing we can do is we can look at the cultural assumptions. In the UK, for example, well, there's a reason the Americans shot the British. It still exists today, and it's the case that it's very different. If you're under surveillance there, you don't get a notification in the same way you would in, say, the Netherlands when an investigation is over. An example I heard in the Parliament was <clears throat> actually a really great one. When there's a murder that takes place, it is customary in the Netherlands that the whole family of the murder victim is placed under surveillance. And it's known in Dutch society by... Many people, I was told, although I don't know if it's true, I don't know how to verify that, but it's generally known and not a secret that your house and your family are monitored, and when the investigation concludes, you're notified. Now, this is a really radical departure from the United States, where you could be under investigation for your entire life and you'll never be told about it, and uh, you could be monitored and you'll never find out about it. They could break into your house and steal things and put other things in there and they'll never tell you about it. So... At the same time, what cryptography does is it forces the cultures of the United States, the United Kingdom, the Netherlands, and other countries to converge onto detectable and thus disclosable surveillance activities. We're really getting there. So regardless of the UK culture, mathematics is going to change that culture. It exists now. So when you make that ZRTP call, if they haven't broken into your phone, but they want to do a man-in-the-middle attack on the wire, and this, of course, becomes a bigger problem when you have peering between different VoIP providers, um, it's exactly then that you're going to have some bits flip. So what do we do when those bits flip? Like, I, I made a suggestion to um, uh, one of the great living free software hackers of the planet for secure communications, Fred Jacobs, and I said to him, look, the short authentication strings don't match up. What do I do now? He's like, well, you know, hang up the call. And I said, well, but, but, but wait, like, there's potentially an attack here. How do I gather the evidence that allows me to figure out who's doing the attack and at what layer and so on? And it was clear that we barely figured out, generally as a community, what we actually do with regard to verifying just a short authentication string, let alone what we might do if we had an attack. Because, of, of course, in theory, you don't really need to worry about an attack. 
But the reason we're building these things is because actually we do need to worry about attacks. So we need some accountability. And that's the next step. So your short authentication strings, they don't match up, or your SSL certificate authorities don't match up. And we, we need to be able to know that when we found out about an interception that we can do something about it. So let me give some examples of how we know that there's you know, valid options that the police might have. So imagine you're a woman alone, because everybody loves women alone as an example for caring. So I'm going to get you to care. So there's a woman alone, and she's driving, and an unmarked police car, that is to say just a normal car, all of a sudden takes out a, a light, and they put it on the roof, and they try to pull you over. In many places, especially in the United States, you are allowed to continue driving and to call 911, or 112 in Europe, I suppose, and verify that you are being pulled over by a real police officer. Because otherwise, potentially, you're a woman alone driving somewhere, and some creep gets a red light, impersonates a police officer, and that's the last anybody ever saw of you. And we think that's reasonable. Because you want to know that you're not about to be a victim of a crime. Because otherwise, impersonating the police is, of course, a very serious problem. And likewise, you have the same thing. If somebody kicks down your door and runs in your house with, you know, balaclavas and machine guns, you have a right to defend yourself in many countries. The Castle Doctrine says this. But if they yell police, you have to put your weapons down and basically submit. Unless you're in Indiana, you can shoot them. But that's separate. <laughs> um, there are some, there are some, there's some edge cases to that. Um, and so, but the point is, what happens when a bad actor who has a balaclava and a machine gun and otherwise looks like a very peaceful police peace officer, uh, what, what exactly do you do when that bad actor then, of course, declares that they're the police? I mean, it's obviously illegal to impersonate a police officer, but the thing is that when you impersonate the police officer and you have the machine guns and potentially you were there to do some harm, obviously impersonating the police officer is like significantly less of a charge than like murdering someone in their home. So do you really care? If that's the thing that gets you to do it. So that's a problem. How do we verify that? Obviously, Indiana has an interesting solution, a very American solution, which is you can shoot them. Um, um, I don't think that's right, right? I think we want to put our cyber arms down, right? So it's important. Okay, but then imagine, this is a much more common one. I know several people in the room that have had this experience, which is someone comes to your door and they have a search warrant. Right? The FBI is talking about this all the time. Like, you go, we, you know, with a lawful order from a judge, you should be able to go to someone, and you should be able to decrypt their telephone. Yeah, okay, that sounds interesting. I like that idea. But what can you do with a search warrant? You can challenge the search warrant. You can say, look, it's not signed by a judge. You just made this up. What are you doing? Get out of my house, right? And you can, of course, say, okay, maybe this is a valid search warrant, but how do I know you're really a cop? Right? And so, again, we have this situation where it's not completely unilaterally the case that all the time anyone who ever shows up is without question given full access to everything. Right? So there's some pushback here. One of my favorite examples, which Chris Seglane gave me, was that Tupac almost hit two guys who were like in plain clothes uh, in a car, and they pulled out guns without identifying themselves as police. So Tupac pulled out a gun and shot them, or shot at them, I guess. And I think that's a really interesting example where Tupac got away with it. Tupac actually shot American police, or shot at American police, because they didn't identify themselves. I mean, usually when a black man pulls a gun on a white cop, for example, that is not the outcome. So <laughs> that tells you, I mean, that's, right? I mean, and, and that's not to like make light of that situation. It's just to say there are incredible exceptions, but we tend to imagine that these exceptions don't exist, actually. And we tend to imagine that the police, you know, they're always the enemy and that there's no limit to what they can do. So we acknowledge, just as I say here on this slide, sorry to read the slide, but we acknowledge that there's a serious issue of police impersonation, and we want people to be safe. That's the goal. The goal is not to enable a jackbooted, thug police state. The point is to make for a safer society, right? That's the, the goal here, is to have that. Don't, don't have an aneurysm. I know you look like you're going to have one. Don't do it. <clears throat> Just relax. So how do we detect crime? Whoop, that was not the slide I wanted it to be. But it, it basically fits, right? So how do we detect crime? It turns out that if you experience a man-in-the-middle attack on the Internet, you basically, you're, you're done. Nobody cares. If you say, like, oh, I tried to visit this website and I got an SSL error, you can't go to a prosecutor and do anything. And a canonical example of this is that when we exposed that Chancellor Merkel had been wiretapped by the NSA, we went, of course, and we talked with a lot of people and included the chancellery, for example. I was working at Der Spiegel at the time. And the prosecutor, of course, knows that Merkel was wiretapped by the NSA. They know that it was a, a passive tap 
with a selector. They understand that it was selector-based surveillance. But what did they do? Well, they said, we don't have any evidence. Now, it's fine if a prosecutor doesn't prosecute something based on political uh, reasons for doing it. I, of course, you know, you want to make sure that you know, white people don't get in trouble, for example, which is the case when they get caught with exactly the same drug as a person of color, because you want to make sure society's more fair, right? And so that's an important detail. You want to make sure that prosecutors always are able to do these things, and, uh, you know, they get to decide. But, you know, there is an actual deficiency, which is that we don't have a standard of evidence that ensures that there'll be an investigation, which ensures that it's possible for us to know that it really is a political reason rather than a technicality of the law. So we need a new standard of evidence. And the standard of evidence is, is important, but let's, let's just recap here for a second. The first thing is we acknowledge that there's a change in thinking. The second thing is that we move towards more and more transparency, which is, of course, important. But what I mean by that is that we switch to protocols that go from passive surveillance vulnerable to active detective, like actual models where you can now know someone is listening. You know, modulo the fact that your endpoint is probably owned. Let's just pretend that you figured that out. We're going to get to that point in the future. When Joanna and Subgraph team up with GRSEC, we're going to have a device which you're going to be able to use, which will be very difficult to break into, for example. And eventually, it's when people try to talk that someone will get in the middle. So we're going to move to that. And when that talk happens, there's going to be a detectable bit. That's, just, that's where we're headed. Many people, including a guy who did lawful interception for a large German telephone company, uh, he mentioned in the European Parliament a couple of days ago, uh, some interesting stuff, but one of the thoughts was you could just never reveal that information. And I tried to explain over and over and over again, that ship has sailed. What do we do now? And there's an important detail also. There's a, an elephant in the room, which is there's, with all that cynicism, people say, well, but, but you can't control, you know, bad actors. And, and, and the, the, the sort of unsaid thing is they're kind of slighting the police. They're saying the police are bad actors. We can't trust them. But I assert the opposite. I assert you can always trust your local police officer because they're there to help you. And, you know, the FSB in Russia, they're not. And you can't trust them. And they're not going to do the right thing. So what we want to do is we want to design a system that allows us to trust our local police officers, to have our best interests in mind, and then to make sure that we detect bad actors like the Chinese Secret Services or, you know, New York police when you live in California, for example, because we don't trust the New York Police Department in California. And, uh, you know, and we, and we have no democratic control over them. So if we don't have that, what, what do we have? Well, we do have local, and maybe we have national. So, of course, we can also trust the FBI because they don't have a history of, you know, incredible violence and racism or anything like that. So there's really a very low chance that they're going to continue with a pattern of abuse once we move them into a detectable world. And, of course, they say they want this secure golden key, so let's just go for it. What do we want? We're going to collect the information. So you, you make a call. So I call Fred or I call Phil in the back of the room there. And we've got the standard of evidence. And then what we do is we just make sure that the police, when they do a man-in-the-middle attack, they give us a signature. It's really simple. The police generate a key. They put it in a hardware security module. And that signature includes an ID. And that ID must be something that corresponds to something for it to be legal. That is, it has to correspond to a docket number. There must be a judge involved. It is the case that it has to point to a real lawful order. Remember, this is not about intelligence. Intelligence already lost a lot anyway because what did they do? Well, you know... They do it all in secret, and they actually moved us to this active world. So they're going to break into the device more than the law enforcement will. They're going to use other things. But MC catchers and stuff, they're going to sort of like go down in use in some ways with this end-to-end -end crypto. They're going to have to move into ownage, or they're going to have to move into man-in-the-middle. And ownage is very expensive. Man-in-the-middle is effectively free. And it would be even more free in this sense because you would, of course, assert your lawful. You would have a signature, and it would have this. So now, just like with a search warrant, you can go to a court, and you can say, hey, I tried to make this phone call. And the local police said they're recording the call. And so I think we can do this. So you still get all the confidentiality channels of ZRTP that you would want, except from the police, of course. And you can trust them. And you can go to the judge. And you know that it'll be fair. And everything will be right. And there'll be justice. And that's important. And that means that you'll be in much better shape than you were. And there's no golden key. There are only secret keys that allow you to assert that you are this lawful entity. And that's important also, because what it means is you know that the police will never lose those keys. Because they're on the hook. If they lose the keys and somebody uses their keys in the wrong way, well, they're the ones that have to go to court and explain that all the time. They're the ones that have to deal with revocation. They're the ones that are no longer the ones that have the integrity that they previously thought. And so, you know, you can, of course, continue with the phone call. 
And people will say to this, oh, but you know, criminals, they're going to change their behavior. But if we go back, we remember everybody in this room, criminals, maybe they already changed their behavior, but they didn't get anything back for it. And in this case, if you don't have a signature and the codes match up, you can feel better. You can stop feeling like you're on those lists. You can start to feel good again about those calls. You can feel like you have integrity in your internet communications again. It can flip around the negative aspects of the Snowden revelations. And so this is great because we can also change another rule, which is that when there isn't a valid signature and you've collected the evidence, you make it so that a prosecutor must act on your behalf. You make it so that when there is evidence that an illegal interception has occurred, that they actually have to investigate it or just to decide for political reasons not to investigate it. It's really straightforward. So an additional requirement is that, of course, cryptophone and Signal, they don't need to help make this happen. And you don't have to help them. You don't have to accept the certificate. But the key thing is to get the police to use their keys when it is lawful. In other words, we're going to make sure that they go to this targeted surveillance model, and then in the targeted surveillance model, we actually force them. And so, of course, we're going to have the same thing for malware. So, you know, you got to put your police badge on the malware. And that's an important thing to do so we know that it's legitimate malware, so we know we can comply with the police when they're monitoring us, just like when they were searching our house. We can be a good citizen and just let the police into our house, and it's just no problem. You can trust them. They're not going to plant evidence, right? They're law enforcement, right? Law enforcement would never do anything bad with this, and that's fine. It's totally fine. And so this is great because we solved the golden key requirement. And in fact, it, it helps us because in the past, they wanted a golden key, they wanted key escrow or something like that, but they could lose the key or the key could be stolen. But in this case, the key is really only valid through a social mechanism, which would allow us, for example, to go to a judge. If there's no lawful order, then you know that a crime is committed and they need to investigate it. This is great, too, because whenever someone doesn't sign it, it tells us about the prevalence of actual illegal things taking place all the time where the state is failing to protect us which is a very important detail because the state has a duty of care to protect its citizens. And when the law is being broken and we have data about that, we can actually show that there's negligence. And obviously, they're barely going to use these keys because as we know from targeted surveillance, they very rarely target people for surveillance. And that is a key thing as well, which is that we don't have to worry about this being used very often anyway because probably nobody in this room is actually a target of surveillance. We're just paranoid. And this will help us to confirm that. Right? It will give us data about other illegal actors who are bad actors, which is not our local actors. And that's important. And the, the most important part is the cops have been asking, how can we do this? And this is the way that we do it. They get to do this, but they can't do it in secret. So no more secret surveillance. That's the trade-off. Now, how you do this securely and secretly is sort of beyond me other than just a man-in-the-middle attack, but that's always detectable. And then it looks like the same methods of, you know, common criminals or not-so-common, well-funded criminals like the NSA. So this is the proposal. I think it's pretty straightforward, and it gives us an equal standard. It brings us back to an age when we had more justice, more freedom in our societies. And I think that that's a really useful thing because it gives us statistics also about this. So... That note, I don't want to take any questions. And instead, what I wanted to suggest is that if you have an alternate proposal for what we could do for Golden Keys, I'd like to suggest that you, that you propose it now. Um, but don't say things like thoughts should be kept secret or that the right to form and hold ideas is something that the United Nations says is a protected right because that's not a solution for law enforcement. And what we need is a solution for trusted law enforcement, not untrusted intelligence services. So, of course, take it away, Dan. All right. Before people come up with their alternate proposals, let's thank the speaker. <laughs> and apparently there's uh, another possible proposal here. So, All right. Stephen, my proposal is don't do this. <laughs> but, but, but no, let's be clear. What's radical about this proposal, there's only one radical thing, and it depends on where you come from if you see that. But there's only one radical thing about the proposal, which is I just propose that the police have a way to assert that they're honest. Everything else is already happening. So, so it's not uh, aside from its, its uh, radical aspect, it, it just doesn't work because there are many protocols that are used on the Internet and have to be used where you, you won't always be able to detect a man in the middle because they need men in the middle. So conference calls. 
No, conference calls uh, with Silent Circle, multi-party conference calls are all end-to-end -end encrypted. It works very scale. well. The, the, you know, at, at very large multicast conferences or something, I, I just don't believe that it's actually feasible in all cases to do this. And in that case, it's just the proposal falls. I mean, if there's end-to-end -end encryption that's possible, you can always tamper with the end-to-end. -end. And if there's no end-to-end, -end, then you just do the man-in-the-middle somewhere else, and the party who sees the, the man-in-the-middle attack might not be the end user. And that's okay. I agree that it doesn't work in every case, but the main thing is for the cases that the police are often really unhappy about, we know that, that of course, this could work. And, of course, you can't force everybody to sign it, but there's an important detail I left out, which I'm kind of surprised no one mentioned this, but I guess it was for me to mention. There was a court judgment, in the, the European Court of Human Rights, which was just released on Friday, which says that mere oversight is not enough. You actually have to have accountability. They were making a judgment against the Russians in this case, for the SORM system. And they were saying that not only do you have to have oversight, you have to have, like, an internal log. So the radical thing I'm proposing here is merely that that log is exposed to a third party, in this case, the user. And that's to trade off the paranoia. Again, so that's the single bit that's radical. For the United States, it's a very radical proposal. Uh, for the UK, it's a very radical proposal. For the Netherlands, it's like ex ante versus ex post facto. So that's not that radical. But it's true. It won't work for everything on the Internet. But we really do care about this because we know, for example, that all the attackers in every terrorist organization obviously would use something like a secure telephone or the web. And so we need to come up with a solution for that. And we're eventually going to see these man-in-the-middle attacks. So how do we know that it's a lawful authority or not? Sure. So, so I mean, you know, so my, my, I think equally unrealistic proposal, in fact, would be to try and have a discussion about requirements for lawful intercept, but the, the relevant people won't have that discussion in the open. So my proposal fail, fails also. All right. I really hope someone brings up Jonathan Swift, or I feel like this has just failed horribly. I'm, I'm not Eating sure. Eating babies is wrong. I don't want to be right. I'm not sure I have an alternate proposal, but uh, we need to come up with a solution for law enforcement is accepting their frame. Because this is, and, and, and it's toxic in the way that, that if you, if you accept that frame, you accept it not just once, you accept it always. Then every time there is a problem, uh, if every time there is an intelligence failure, every time there is a problem, you can say, well, you guys come up with a better solution then. And, and I don't think it works that way. I think you should, I think you, you're, you should fairly just, uh, um, how shall I formulate this? Maybe I'll think about this some more. But I don't think you should accept that frame without questioning. Um, well, I, I agree. I, I don't think we should do that. This entire talk was meant as a sarcastic sort of commentary. And I'm sorry if that wasn't clear, but I thought it was clear by the modest proposal title. Um, but, but that said, I mean, we have accepted that frame, and we've actually said it can't be done. And the problem with the it can't be done rhetoric or the uh, we can't do it for the mass cases but for targeted is okay is that actually – also shows us a deficiency in accepting this idea of targeted surveillance, which sort of suggests that we don't understand how targeted surveillance is even done, which is through mass surveillance these days. Um, so, of course, I agree with you entirely if we were to take this into a serious realm. But the problem is that our discourse basically discounts everybody who instantly becomes targeted and says that that's valid and that anything can be done to them. And that's just not the case. And that we basically have given up on any of the societal processes and in some cases, many of us have just moved to the IETF thinking that that will be better. And while it certainly is better than most of the democracies I've participated in in a lot of ways, it doesn't, it doesn't solve that it isn't existing in a vacuum. It exists in this other context. So, uh, I, I don't have a proposal either, sorry to disappoint. Um, but as a, as a Brit, um, the sort of threat of this ban on uh, encryption, the, the way I see it is that it's going to be more, you know, the forcing of uh, Facebook or someone to hand over the data. And I, I really like the talk and the, the whole concept, but have you, have you thought about how we can do that sort of detection when data is compelled from a third party or if that is even feasible? Thank you. I mean, in a, in a, in if we were to take this into a really serious realm now, I think the answer is don't use Facebook, kid. Uh, but the other, I'm sorry to say it like that, but I mean, uh, that's sort of like saying, you know, doctor, it hurts when I go like this. You know, it's, we're, we're not going to solve, when we have centralized systems like Facebook, you're not going to solve it because ultimately they're subject to coercion. Uh, there's a, there's an attacker, you know, we have, we have Alice Bob, Mallory, we have Eve and so on, but there's another attacker. Um, and I think, uh, Leif Riggi, a friend of mine that lives in Berlin, he calls it, uh, penny bags is the attacker. So it's a, it's a canonical model of an attacker, which is all about being an intermediary that extracts wealth from your data. Uh, and Pennybags is there, and maybe Pennybags is going to try to get more money or they're going to keep the money they already have. And so something like this won't matter anyway. I mean, 
this data is already going, and in some cases the law stops them from doing it. So without end-to-end -end crypto, you can't really move to a detectable setup. You have to be in a detectable framework to try to force transparency. The key thing here is that there are all these crimes on the internet that are being committed, and nobody wants to look into them sometimes because those crimes on the internet are being committed by the people allegedly trying to stop the crimes. And so that's the, the purpose of that. Obviously, I think Facebook, it's just like a lost cause. I mean, it's great for parties, it's fantastic for surveillance, but you're not going to be able to force real change with that because it's not decentralized or distributed. Okay, we saw, uh, I was just going to say we still have a few minutes for questions and somebody took the bait already. I have one part fun and one part serious. So, um, I, pres I, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Oh, I propose we could lower the bar for the warrant or whatever is needed by breaking up the man in the middle key into a, a, a public key, which you get, uh, to log the data. Uh, and, and police are given that first, just as sort of a passive surveillance uh, place. So you're notified you're being surveilled, but not intercepted or analyzed. So you're put on notice. And then uh, if you actually commit a crime at some point, then the private key can be, re be released and essentially time travel back, and then you're revealed. So we, we can I introduce the sort of chilling effect uh, aspect of this as well, so you can spread it much farther than just I mean, the, the I, I mean, that is actually the next logical step, and I'm glad that you suggested that, because nothing helps the police like adding a chilling effect. And so we should definitely try to do that whenever we possibly can. But what was your joke suggestion? <laughs> uh, we use triple des for that. No. Um, um, so, uh, the more serious side, I think, is the idea that when man-in-the-middle attacks happen, those of us who build attacks that should sense this, A, need to do a better job of presenting the all evidence and gathering and snapshotting it and have a place to submit this. So I know right now with Chat Secure, we just sort of barf and say, yeah, not verified, something weird is going on. And I've thought about that a lot yep. to say, well, I've thought about what we should be doing that we're not doing. And I think in all cases, it needs to... We, we should have a whole design conference on detecting and reporting man in the middle somehow. Yeah, I mean, so in a totally non-satirical way, I just want to sort of echo what you're saying and, and to just kind of say that we, we, we think two steps ahead, but now we need to think 20 steps ahead. And that's one of the things where we're not really doing that, and we should do that before we arrive there. If we arrive in a world where these men in the middle attacks or machine in the middle or whatever uh, uh, straw men in the middle are, um, I think we will be very sad when we arrive there. For example, January 1st in Kazakhstan, there is a discussion by the government of Kazakhstan that they're going to start man in the middle all TLS traffic and you'll have to install their root CA. Um, that's really problematic. And how do we even observe that traffic? How do we understand how that's happening? Um, we just really haven't thought ahead to that. The UNI project from the TOR project that's run by Arturo Falasto, I think, is starting to work on that, but that's a very niche thing for very specific people. So we have to get a lot further along with that, but we still need to find a way to tie that back to society. And that's a thing which, unless we really give up on society, and I'm not a libertarian that thinks that we should do that, um, it, 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 it suggests to me that we need something else. And so if you could add to Chat Secure, for example, Nathan, something like that, that might be a useful thing to do, but it's also not clear to me that that will be easy to do. Uh, for example, I think that law enforcement will actually be really unhappy if you start to do that when they have a prevalent uh, surveillance, active surveillance that's going on. They'll feel like you should not only backdoor your crypto, but you should stop making it easy for users to make it detectable, and you should not record it or help in any way. And so that's, I think, we're going to see a new pressure point there, and we'll have to accept that, and perhaps we'll have to think really hard about it. Tanja Lange, Eindhoven. Um, I don't have a proposal, I don't have a counterproposal or anything, um, just something that struck me when you were saying it, and now again when, when Nathan was mentioned, chat secure. When you see something that you call or your chat or whatever is not getting the other end to be proper, it might also be just a denial of service attack, which will get you to rekey, and they want to be there when you rekey. Mm -hmm. So I don't even know what is the right behavior when you see it. Hang up at that moment, totally, but throw away your old key and say it's compromised, or rather hold on to that key because that's the last one that was not compromised. Mm. 
Yeah, and uh, I mean, another another aspect of this is that maybe you want to force someone, so that you want to detect that there's a man in the middle, and you want to force someone to change to a different communication channel, which is less secure, so you can surveil them in a different way where they feel safe again or where they don't realize this is happening, obviously. But uh, I'm surprised that no one else made the proposal that I suspect Dan will say entirely, but uh, I guess you're going to make it now. No, 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 it's, it's uh, on, a, on a subtopic. On, on kind of post facto detection of man in the middle, I had a look at this last year. I didn't get very deep into it because it doesn't work for most things like the web. But there are some cases where if, if both sides of the valid conversation have a pre-existing session identifier or something that the man in the middle can't attack, that you might be able to actually do it and have a, a kind of an evidence gathering protocol that would work. Well, I think ZRTP has that session caching for exactly that reason. So you know you've had a conversation with a device and that, that it's still consistent, and otherwise you have to do a full re-verification. So I think Phil thought of exactly that for ZRTP, but it doesn't work for the web, right. and that's very different, of course. But with certificate transparency and other things like that, I think maybe we could see web browsers having a cache like that. Where, where so we I think so. one case that, where it looked like it could work was in, in email. So if you have a DKIM signatures on, on, on the messages, and if breaking lots and lots of those was detectable, then actually that might make it possible to work for that. But it's a very particular case. Yeah. All right. I think in the interest of time, let's say any further questions, go to the coffee break. Let's thank the speaker again.